At this time, the court calls State of Wisconsin v. Stephen Avery, case number 05-CF381. We are here this afternoon to conduct the jury instructions conference and address a few other matters that still require the court's attention. We are obviously not in the presence of a jury at this time. Will the parties state their appearances for the record, please? Good afternoon, Your Honor. May it please the court. State appears by Assistant Attorney General Tom Fallon, District Attorney Gingras, and Assistant District Attorney Norm Gaughan as Special Prosecutor for Manitowoc County. Good afternoon. Stephen Avery is present in person and Dean Strang appears on his behalf. I specifically want to note that the defense thinks it's proper to have conducted a discussion in chambers informally about jury instructions before this. I participated in that willingly. I did not ask to have my client present. I don't, I do not think he was required to be present as a matter of the Sixth Amendment or the correlative provisions of the Wisconsin Constitution. As far as I'm concerned, it is not an issue. All right. And as a follow up to that, I will indicate for the record that the counsel for both sides and the court met in chambers this morning to conduct an informal instruction conference. Agreement was reached on some matters. Some matters are still outstanding. At this time, the court is conducting the formal jury instruction conference. And along those lines, Mr. Strang, I should ask, I don't know if you had a chance to address the subject of jury instructions with your client, but if you would like to request some time to do that, I will take a recess to permit you to do it. I haven't done it. I don't see a need to do it. If Mr. Avery has a question, I think he knows he can always ask me. All right. Why don't I do this? I will stay here, but I will go off the record for a couple of minutes. I want to make sure you at least have the chance to talk to him about it before we proceed any further, because I normally, I do allow, and it's true often that the defendant doesn't choose to participate directly in a discussion, because it's, because it's legal concepts that aren't that familiar with most defendants. But I think it's important to at least give the defence counsel a chance to speak with the defendant so we're going off the record for a couple of minutes. We have talked a little bit. Mr. Avery, I think, understands why I didn't suggest he participate in the informal discussion of jury instructions, and he knows that we're going to cover the same ground here this afternoon, and Your Honor will make the final decision on jury instructions on the basis of what we do here in court. Very well. I will indicate at this time that I distributed to each parties, each party got a set of proposed jury instructions that, in many cases, take into account matters on which the parties indicated agreement earlier this morning. Rather than read instructions in their entirety, I am simply going to ask each counsel to acknowledge on the record that they have received a copy of the proposed jury instruction, which red line is the term typically used, but I have highlighted in shaded form, modifications which the court has made to the original draft of the jury instructions, which the court gave to the parties. Mr. Strang, have you received a copy of the latest update? I have, I have the March 13, 2007 redlined draft copy of jury instructions, which runs into a 14th page in my site. And Mr. Fallon, have you received them? Yes, Judge. On behalf of the state, we would acknowledge receipt of that very same copy, did briefly examine it prior to going on the record, and it appears to conform to what our preliminary discussions resulted in. All right, and I should indicate I inserted the shady provisions in order to our attention to the changes that have been made from the earlier draft. Obviously, the final set of jury instructions will not contain any red lining of any form because of a copy of the full set will be given to each of the members of the jury. Let me ask, at this point, on behalf of the state, Mr. Fallon, are the jury instructions, as they have been submitted, acceptable to the state? Well, they are acceptable, although we did want it to be heard briefly, I think on an argument relative to a theory of defense. But in terms of the other matters which are set forth in the second draft of dated March 13th, we are, full, we are in full accord. All right, I will hear you with anything you wish to say about the theory of defence instruction that is found on page 5 of the draft at this time. Thank you. In an effort to succinctly get to the point, we do not believe that the theory of defence instruction submitted by the defence is one which is appropriate for submission to the jury. We do so not because we think the defence is not entitled to such a theory of defence instruction, 
but only in so far as the theory of defense instruction submitted by the defense, we do not believe is sufficiently and solidly based in the evidence which was presented during the course of the trial. And as such, we do not believe that the instruction should be given to the jury that there's not sufficient evidence in the record from which a reasonable juror come to the conclusion that there has been some planting of evidence, that there has been some been evidence of a frame up involving members of law enforcement, and now apparently some unknown other person or persons. And as such, uh, evidence we think is deficient and invites speculation and conjecture on the part of the jurors. And we would ask its instruction not be given because we do not believe it to be based in evidence presented. Mr. Strang. The court's version of the theory of defense instruction on page five has its origins primarily in defense proposed jury instruction number nine, submitted on March 10th. I think for purposes of jury instructions, the theory of defense instruction that we tendered as number nine meets the three criteria for a court in deciding whether to instruct a jury on any point of law. There is, this is an, an accurate statement of law and I don't hear the state to contend otherwise. The matter is not otherwise covered in the court's proposed jury instruction. Again, I don't hear the state to contend otherwise. Mm -hmm. And there's at least some evidence which, if accepted by a jury, reasonably would allow the inference of the conclusion that Mr. Avery was not the person. If someone did, he was not the person who killed Teresa Halbach or burned her body, and that others instead did and took actions to make it appear that Mr. Avery was guilty. I don't, I'm not going to go through the entire trial, but I think the evidence more than supports a reasonable jury in drawing that conclusion from the evidence, if the jury wishes. And that's why this is called a theory of defense instruction, and that's why there are also theories of prosecution. A jury may or may not choose to accept one side's theory or the other, but there is an adequate evidentiary basis for the instruction as submitted, number nine. It should be given. I agreed further to modifications of number nine, defense proposed number nine. The court's modifications set out here on page five of the red line draft of instructions is acceptable to the defense. And if the court gives the theory of defense instruction as now worked in this red line instruction, I will accept the modification of the defense number nine. I also, again, on the, ex on the express predicate that the court gives the theory of defense instruction as set forth here, and prepared to withdraw defense proposed instruction number one and defense proposed instruction number two. Those are more specific refinements. I recognize that I could not satisfy this court or an appellate court that the general theory of defense set forth here by the court did not otherwise cover the matters suggested in number one and number two as proposed by the defense. So I would withdraw those if the court gives the theory of defense instruction as set forth on page five of today's draft. Thank you. As I indicated to council and chambers, the, as a pre-request to the theory of a defence instruction, there is a requirement that there be evidence in the record to support the giving of the instruction. The case law suggests that the quantum of evidence that is required in order to justify the instruction is very low. There is a Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals case, United States v. Bull, Bull, case number 435F2D774, which I believe uses the phrase, however tenuous, there must be evidence to support the instruction, so the quantum of evidence that the defendant must demonstrate is not very high. The court believes, and again, I'm not going to go over the evidence myself either, but the defence has introduced circumstantial evidence to support its theory of defence. The defence is not required to meet the beyond a reasonable doubt standard that the state must meet in order to prove guilt, and the court concludes that there is sufficient evidence in the record and it's my understanding that if the decision is made to give such an instruction, that the form on page 5 is acceptable to both parties, recognising the state opposes the giving of the instruction in any form. That would be correct. OK, does the state have any other modifications to propose to the jury instructions? We do not. Mr Strang, before I ask you to address other requested instructions that are still at issue, 
I did want to confirm that the defence is requesting that the court give instruction 315 relating to the defendant electing not to testify. That's an instruction the court is directed to give if the defendant requests it. I'm requesting pattern instruction 315 and as worded on page 12 of today's red line draft, it is acceptable to the defence. Alright, the court will include 315. Then, and it's also my understanding, Mr. Strang, that although the defence has other proposed instructions to offer, that there's not a dispute about the instructions that are already in the draft. Is that correct? That's right. That's right and wrong. I will be arguing that some additional defence instructions should have been included yet, but, you know, subject to that argument, the wording of the draft I have in front of me is acceptable. I will make an extemporaneous suggestion and suggestion only that pattern instruction 58 as modified and that it appears near the bottom of page 8 might might be better moved to either page 12 or page 13, either right before or right after the 460, the closing instruction, just as a matter of flow. But that's that that's a suggestion only. It also could go right after 103 on page 1 or page 2. It looks to me out of place where it is on page 8, but that's, you know, a suggestion at most. Alright, my logic is placing it there. And keep in mind that it's actually part of the opening instructions that the court typically gives. It's not always included in the closing instructions, but since it relates to information about the case that the jury might request to see, I placed it right after 155 because 155 addresses somewhat similar issues as it relates to requesting that exhibits be sent to the court or to the jury room. At pointing out to the jurors that the exhibits is received, whether it goes to the jury room or not, but I don't have particularly strong feelings about its placement. I don't know how the state... That's a pretty good rationale and I'm going to accept placement wherever the court thinks it's best. I just thought I would offer that suggestion. Alright. I also think, with respect to 315, which is the last instruction the court gives before the closing instruction, I think its placement, as the last thing that the jury hears before the closing, is deliberate, probably in recognition of the importance of a defendant's right not to testify. At least that's the way I have always interpreted it. And I hate to take that away from a defence, unless the defence feels otherwise. No, I'm in complete agreement with the court on that. Alright. We'll then move on to the instructions that were requested by the defence, that are still part of its request. And as I understand it, number one and two have been withdrawn, so that takes us on to the proposed instruction number three, relating to chain of custody. Yes, Your Honour. One and two, which are in March 8, 2007 submission, are withdrawn. No, number three is not withdrawn, although, as I suggested informally in chambers, I readily would accept a substantial modification of this instruction. The nub of the legal point that I wish to communicate to the jury is that the court's decision to admit an exhibit as opposed to admit testimony of a witness, the court's decision to admit an exhibit says nothing about the weight that the jury ought to give the exhibit or any other exhibit. And so the concept I want to capture is the same one that the legislature captured in section 909.01 of the Wisconsin Wisconsin statutes. It's the name it's the same concept that the legislature drives at in section 901.04 of the Wisconsin statutes which you know concerns primarily determinations of admissibility conditional admissibility 901.03 may be another Wisconsin statute that goes to the concept that determining something admissible doesn't mean that the exhibit is what the proponent claims necessarily, just means that a jury so could find reasonably. And it doesn't mean anything about the weight. The court hasn't, been, hasn't passed on the weight of an exhibit by admitting an exhibit. Why does it matter here? Well, we have got 501 marked exhibits. Almost all those have been admitted. It's just a handful or two. I don't know the, the precise number, but it's a small number of the marked exhibits that were not also received by the court. Much of the physical evidence here is hotly disputed in terms of its meaning, its importance, the weight that it ought to be given to it. And you know, I don't think the instructions otherwise cover exhibits very well. It is true that pattern number 148 refers to other evidence, but there remains some ground that can be covered and should be covered, 
quickly and uncontroversially within the scope of the, the defendant's proposed instruction number three. So that's my argument there. I overlooked one point that I wanna go back to, if I may, while I'm thinking about it, in the court's red line instructions, and that is at page six. It's the last paragraph in the instruction on elements of the crime of felon in the possession of a firearm. Now, we have stipulated the truth of the second element, so the state need not prove, did not need to offer evidence and to establish the second essential element of the offense of felon in possession of, a possession of a firearm. It's established by stipulation. I think, and I can't cite a case because I can't call it to mind and I haven't had time to look at it, but I think there is a constitutional authority that notwithstanding a stipulated element, the courts still not, may not instruct a jury that it must accept an essential element of an offense as conclusively proved. It is clear to me that the court may instruct a jury that it may accept the second element in this offense as conclusively proved. And again, the element is not in dispute. But ultimately, this goes to the fundamental role of the jury as the finder of facts and the ultimate arbiter of whether a person will be convicted of a crime. And I wish I had a case to cite or the source of the authority, but I just, I have the, I have the sense that must accept a stipulation of, as an element goes uh, one half step too far. And I just, I wanted to alert the court and counsel that to, the, to that potential constitutional infirmity in the instruction, if I'm right. The element remains stipulated, but we're not gonna argue it. You know, we're not going to argue to a jury that it's not proven. We're not backing off the stipulation. A jury certainly may and should accept that stipulation. I just don't know that the jury must as a matter of the right to a jury trial. Mr. Fallon. Ordinarily, I would say that counsel might have something that's worth our concern here. But I think first and foremost, when the issue is not in dispute that for all intents and purposes, I think moots out of concern regarding the language choice between must and may in terms of accepting that particular element of, a fa of fact. Secondly, there's a common sense perspective here, and that is if the issue is not in dispute, it's, an, it's as if the element is not there. It's not part of the crime because it's not a matter in which there's, there's nothing for the jury to consider on that particular point. So why create an issue with the language choice when there is no issue to be had? So I think from that common sense perspective, this is a concern that we need not spend more time on than it's duly noted. And by the way, and third, it is the language that is preferred choice of the jury instruction co uh, committee. All right. I hesitate to speak from memory about the cases that I haven't read in years, but I do recall that this matter came up before. I think it was in the Villarreal case, or Villarreal, however it was pronounced, where the court required, or the appeals court required, that the personal waiver be taken from the defendant as opposed to the stipulation by the parties because it involved an element of the offence. The language that the court is using is from the from instruction and I believe it's used deliberately. And this is why I believe it's used in that fashion. By stipulating to the element, that is, the defendant personally stipulating to the element, the state is precluded from offering any evidence to the jury as to the defendant's status as a felon. If the court gave a jury instruction that said simply that the jury may accept that the fact that it is conclusively proved that would indicate that the jury has some direction in the matter. And if the jury had some direction in the matter, it would seem to be unfair not to allow the state to introduce some evidence to try and put any question the jury might have out of its mind. So that's the court. As I understand it, that's the trade-off. The benefit the defence gets that the state is prohibited from introducing any evidence regarding the defendant's status as a felon. But it would seem to me to reciprocate for what the state shouldn't be in a position where it might be penalised by being prohibited on one hand from presenting evidence and having permissive rather than a mandatory language used so that the state that the jury could still find against the state. So I think the language of the pattern instruction has been time tested and I think there is a reason for it. So I'm going to leave the pattern language as it is. Thank you. Defense proposed instruction number four, I was persuaded to withdraw.
just a second. Actually, you finished your argument, number three, but I don't know that I heard back from the state. We kind of got diverted by the other language. Right. Mr. Fallon, what is the state's response to the defence proposed instruction three? Thank you. Our position, in a nutshell, is that it's unnecessary. And it is unnecessary because we think if you take all the instructions in toto, it answers the questions, concerns of the defense. Specifically, counsel referred to instruction 148. I would draw the court's attention to the remaining, the last couple of sentences in instruction 148. Again, uh, you have instruction 155 about exhibits. You also have instruction 300 about the credibility of witnesses. And while I may be prepared to concede that I can conceive of a situation in an item of evidence all by itself, so physically significant and conspicuous, such that this instruction may have some requested instruction, may have some merit or weight. The evidence in this particular case, given the fact that this is a circumstantial evidence case based on powerful scientific evidence, that significance as well as presented in the context of testimony from witnesses. And because of that, coupled with the instruction 148 on objections of counsel and receipt of evidence over objection, the definition of evidence, the definition of exhibits, and finally, I think the instruction that the court gives that you tell the jurors, if I have given you any uh, impression as to what I think the results should be or the significance of evidence, and I'm paraphrasing admittedly, and you should disregard it and trust your own interpretation, your own memory, and come to your own conclusions in this case. And I think when, when you're looking at something like this, you have to take the instructions as a whole and in their entirety to evaluate the evidence, because otherwise we could not have a list, uh, a list of jury instructions that would go 100 pages. I mean, you could come up with an instruction for virtually every circumstance that occurs in a trial. And I just do not believe that this was the intent of the drafters of the model instructions. And as such, I think the instructions as a whole deal with the issues that they raise in their proposed instruction number three. So it is unnecessary. And that's our basis, basis for denial. Brief reply, because we went around and around about this in chambers and the court po posed a very good question on when, when would there ever be an item of physical evidence that had significance independent of the testimony about it, which I really thought was really, I thought it was a fascinating jurisprudential, the question in the end. And the thought finally occurred to me over lunch, and this goes all the way back to Dean Wigmore, and I don't mean Wigmore in evidence after other people took it over. I mean, Professor and Dean Wigmore when he was alive and what he described as an atopic preference. And the classic example he gave was a knife with, with dried blood on it and an item that was so powerful in and of itself that its significance was carried in its presence and its physical quality. And as uh, we have something pretty close to what Dean Wigmore would have called an atopic preference here in, for example, a flattened bullet fragment found in the garage, a Toyota key found in the defendant's bedroom. Again, this was in 1880 and 1890 when people were having these arguments. But I simply think that the concepts covered by the the three statutes I cited on admissibility as a preliminary question and authentication and the basic concept that admissibility does not determine weight is something that the instructions don't otherwise cover and should be. All right. Well, as counsel indicated, the court and the attorneys had fascinating academic discussions in chambers this morning about whether or not there might be some piece of physical evidence that would warrant some instruction in addition to the standard instructions that are given in all criminal cases. I indicated that I did not feel that this case presented that type of stipulation. Taking exhibits, for example, such as a Toyota key, certainly, as it's been offered by the state, the state may well argue that that's a significant piece of evidence against a defendant because it was found in his trailer and alleged to contain his DNA. On the other hand, the defence, I don't think I'm anticipating too much here, will no doubt argue in its closing that if the key had been in the defendant's trailer sometime before the last time he left it, one would have expected that it would have been found before it was, as the trailer was searched on a number of occasions. 
So, and all of these conclusions relate to the testimony that was received from various witnesses. In some cases, I am sure the state or the defence will be relying on evidence from the state's witness to support its argument. But I think that that stipulation demonstrates that this particular case doesn't seem to suggest that there is any piece of physical evidence that by itself is capable of only one conclusion and one conclusion only, and that somehow by not giving further instruction, which would risk appearing as though the court was commenting on specific pieces of evidence, something that the court tries to avoid. And I believe I'm directed to try and avoid. I just don't see that it's necessary. So the court is going to decline to give an instruction along the lines of that suggested by the defence in its proposed instruction number 3. Next, we move on to defence proposed instruction number 4. Mr. Strang? Yes, thank you, Your Honour. That's the one I started to say. I think that I was persuaded in chambers and remain persuaded that is a topic adequately covered by Wisconsin Pattern Com Criminal Jury Instruction 300. And that pattern instruction 300 gives adequate legal support for an argument the parties may want to make. And I withdraw number four for that reason. Number five has been modified and as modified incorporated into the court's red line draft today. The modification is acceptable to the defense and provided the modification on experts and the jury not be, being around to accept an expert's opinion remains in the final instructions. I'm pleased to withdraw defendant's proposed instruction number five. Defendant's proposed instruction number six also I view as having been modified and incorporated into the court's red line draft today. I accept the court's modification and assuming that remains in the final jury instructions to be given in this case, I would withdraw anything more from defendant's proposed instruction number six. Defendant's proposed instruction number seven I understand the court to be inclined to deny. It concerns the general topic of spoliation. I do not withdraw this instruction and I ask the court to reconsider its position. I want to recognize, if for no other reason, that the only, that one always ought to recognize the obvious, that the United States Supreme Court has spoken to an issue related to spoliation in the due process context though, not in the context of an adverse in inference that a jury might be invited to draw, but not required to draw. The Supreme Court decisions, the leading decisions are Arizona against Youngblood, earlier discussed in this trial, I think as, a re as recently as yesterday, and California against Trombetta, also discussed in this trial. I understand and recognize as a matter of due process, only bad faith dis destruction of evidence material to innocence or guilt results in a due process remedy for the defendant, dismissal of charges, or suppression of other evidence. Here I'm interested instead in an adverse inference. Evidence has come in, evidence can come in, consistent with the due process clause if the court is right about suppression rulings that it has made. But the question here is what inferences should be available to the jury and should the jury be informed are in the array of choices as a matter of law. And the state here, there's more than adequate testimony to show that the manner in which the state recovered bone fragments could have led to destruction or loss of those bone fragments. The failure to photograph could have led to human remains not being recognized or recovered at all at the scene. At the scene. And by volume here, Dr. Eisenberg testified that she thought she only had about 40% of a complete human skeleton. So the possibility that remains were not recognized and recovered at all is real and reasonable on, the, on this record. We also had the proffered testimony of Deck Catch, the Manitowoc coroner, excluded by the court on the state's motion and over our objection that would have gone to the prospects for a more successful recovery of human remains with the assistance on the scene of a forensic anthropologist and a forensic pathologist. So where the, where the record would support an inference that material evidence, that is human remains, may have been destroyed or not recovered at all, because of the means employed by the state and adverse inference ought to be available to this jury for spoliation. And it ought to be available on the same standard it would be in a civil case. 
the criminal accused, the person accused in a criminal case surely can't be at an evidentiary disadvantage when compared to a civil defendant arguing over liability or money. I think here that the actions to which Special Agent Thomas Sturdivant testified were deliberate in the sense of intended actions chosen as a matter of free will from the options that Mr. Sturdivant saw available to him. I don't contend that Special Agent Sturdivant acted in bad faith. I'm not going to argue that he did. Although, of course, the good or bad faith of any witness is for the jury to decide in the end. But I don't think we have to show bad faith and evil purpose or motive to establish the actions are deliberate or intentional simply in the ordinary sense of not being accidental or involuntary. So for those reasons, I think the court should give something like defendant's proposed instruction number seven. I always would consider some modification if the language is clumsy or overstates the point, but I've not heard either the state or the court suggest a willingness to modify instruction number seven. And so I advance it with the provision that I have just added. All right, before I turn it over to the state, I do have one question. I'm having trouble determining another inference that might have been drawn if the bones had been collected in a different manner. It's my understanding that I don't know that any of the experts disagreed with the fact that the bones were those of one human being, that the forensic dental information identified the human being as being the victim in this case, or the, the I think that the Dr. Fairgrieve said something about the effect that as if it had, had been like an intact skeleton that was just burned in one piece and stayed there, Perhaps he could tell where it was burned. Now, the court is going to, to the point. A core point of Dr. Fairgrade's opinion is that we will never know where this body was burned because of the manner in which the recovery was undertaken. The absence of photographs and the absence of the careful approach to recovery. And he described what a proper, re proper recovery approach would have been in the view of, in his own view as a forensic anthropologist. And as he said, we don't know. One of the reasons we don't know and will never know in his view where the body was burned is because of the manner of recovery. Now, that can't cut both ways, but it's an issue material to guilt or innocence. That is, it's quite possible to hypothesize that the recovery had, had the recovery, recovery been done properly here, Dr. Fairgrave or Dr. Eisenberg would have been able to give a professional opinion to a reasonable degree of certainty within the field of anthropology that the area behind Stephen Aver Stephen's garage was not the site on which the body was burned originally. That clearly would suggest, it wouldn't be conclusive, but it would suggest Mr. Avery's innocence. Since it's a lot less likely that he would have brought home bones to a place more closely associated with him if he had burned them at a more distant place. It's also possible that a better recovery would have allowed one or both of those experts to conclude that the area behind Mr. Avery's garage was, in their professional opinion, the site of the cremation or incineration. That would have, that would have, attend, that would have tended to strengthen the state's argument for guilt for the reasons conversed as those as I just suggested. But either way, it's material to guilt or innocence. And because we don't know, and because the recovery was the state's effort here, the adverse inference should be available, although of course not forced on the jury. Mr. Fallon. Thank you. I couldn't agree, disagree more with the council. And I come up with at least six reasons why this instruction should not be given. First of all, Council says, well, we don't know where the other 60% of the remains are. Well, that may be true, but it seems to me the most logical, the most plausible, the most reasonable explanation is that they were consumed in the fire. Secondly, Dr. Eisenberg did testify, and this is an uncontroverted because Dr. Fairgrave didn't bother to look at the bones, and she found no evidence of breakage, spoil spoliation, or damage to those bones after they are exposed to the fire. Third, the matter of recovery, council sites would lead one to logically in infer that this instruction should be given. But there's another explanation as to why the remains were found the way they were and why such an opinion that council wishes could have been expressed 
may not have been able to be expressed in any event. And that is the manner of recovery should be juxtaposed with the number and the manner of incineration. The state's theory is correct and accepted by the jury. It wouldn't have mattered if the if it was a funeral pyre, which was being uh, attended to, where its fuel load was constantly being adjusted and that the remains of the person in the fire were constantly stirred up and exposed to the heat, flame, and temperatures such that we only have 40% roughly of the remains. So there are plenty of plausible explanations which support the theory that it would not have mattered. Finally, third, references to a witness testimony is excluded offers up offers us no help whatsoever. Fourth, the Newman standard clearly states that the spoilation and inference instruction should not be given in the absence of clear, satisfactory, and convincing evidence that the partly party intentionally deliberately destroyed evidence. Mere negligence does not suffice. And on that standard, we're woefully short. And finally, there is a common sense argument for the rejection of this and it's also based on the evidence in the trial. Is it not more likely that that, that was a place of Teresa Hobbock's final remains when it is but a few feet away from the spot where she was last seen alive? So for all those reasons, we think the special uh, instruction must be rejected out of hand. Thank you. All right, I'm sure there can be stipulations when an instruction such as that proposed by the defense would be appropriate. I believe that that's a logical reading on the stated Newman case cited by the Defence Council in support of the request. That case, which the court read, was a stipulation and an individual admitted that that he deliberately destroyed relevant evidence, specifically a gun and a suicide note, I believe. In this case, the court doesn't find that there may be a question as to whether or not the collection of the element, collection of the evidence, was done negligently. I believe that that would be a fair characterisation of what Dr. Fairgrieve testified, that he felt he would have done it more carefully. But I don't think that there's any interpretation of the evidence that the court can see where it was done deliberately, with an intention to destroy evidence or render its value meaningless. At the time, the representatives of the state thought they had evidence that they, that was helpful to them, that they would be able to preserve. Whether they took steps that were most effective in preserving the evidence may be subject to doubt but I haven't heard anything really that their motivations were subject to doubt, which is that they were trying to preserve evidence. Their people did not, on the scene, did not, perhaps, have the training of Dr. Fairgreaves, but I'm not simply aware of any facts that would amount to either intentional expolia, its destruction of evidence, bad faith, actions on the part of the state, whatever the standard might be. That would justify giving an instruction such as the one provided, and the court is not going to give it, so that request instruction is denied. The next instruction is defendant's proposal instruction number eight. This concerns prior inconsistent sworn statements. I think the court ought at a minimum give this jury some instruction on prior inconsistent statements. It readily could be appended to pattern instruction 300 on the credibility of witnesses wouldn't have to stand alone. But it's odd that in this state, although pattern instruction 300 gives a number of of different considerations that a jury specifically ought give the witness, the concept of changing one's story, uh, making an inconsistent earlier statement is admitted from that. And I think that's a significant omission. We have at least two rules of evidence that I can think of off the top of my head, section 906.13 of the Wisconsin statutes and section 908.014A that are addressed specifically to prior inconsistent statements. These are understood, at least by lawyers, to bear on the credibility of witnesses. And we ought to let jurors know in on that secret and tell them specifically that they can consider a witness's prior inconsistent statement in weighing the credibility of the witness. It matters here. I don't know of any witness whose credibility is more central both to the defense that Mr. Avery has presented and to the state's response than Lieutenant James Lank. Of course, the credibility of every witness is important but he may be first among equals or close to that in this case. 
And I can't imagine I would get a serious argument from the state about the importance of both sides attached to Link, Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn here. And Lieutenant Link was shown to have made materially different statements under oath than he made on the same topic here at trial. And he was in fact impeached on cross-examination with two prior sworn statements that I think a jury could find are material and consistent with his testimony on direct examination on the question of when did he arrive at the Avery property on November 5th, 2005. This jury should be told specifically that it can consider those prior inconsistent sworn statements in weighing his testimony. Now, I will readily offer to accept a broader statement of prior inconsistent statements. Indeed, I would accept a modification that removed the reference to sworn statements or remove the reference to any to any witness by name as a less favorite alternative to get some instruction that treats the topic of prior and consistent statements. There certainly were other witnesses who were impeached here with prior and consistent statements, albeit unsworn. Scott Taddock comes to mind. Blaine Dassey comes to mind. Bobby Dassey may have been. My memory doesn't serve me entirely at the moment on that. And there may be others that I'm not thinking about at all. But I know it was not just Lieutenant Lank. What made him different is I believe he is the only witness who was impeached by a prior sworn statement. I could live with that if if the court wanted to broaden the concept because the basic concept of considering credibility in the light of whether someone changes his story goes beyond whether the statement is sworn or not. It's important enough that it ought to be addressed for the jury in considering credibility. I think there's no question about the legal accuracy of defendants proposed instruction number eight. I also think that pattern instruction 300 does not adequately cover the topic and no other instruction really comes close. So I do seek something like defendants proposed instruction number eight. Much like previous offered instruction, our argument with this instruction is that it is unnecessarily unnecessary and adequately covered elsewhere in the instruction. And even with the concessions that counsel is prepared to make with respect to identifying the persons who gave inconsistent statements at trial, the instruction as proposed will be is still unnecessary. We disagree with counsel that the pattern instruction 300 is not adequate. 300 has several points, which I think are directly bear upon this situation although it did not expressly mention a prior inconsistent statement. Uh, but just taking, for example, the focus of that defense has chosen to place on Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Coburn, just for instance. One, the first issue under 300 is whether the witness has an, inter has an interest or lack of interest in the result of the trial. Third, the, clear the clearness or lack of clearness of a witness recollection. The apparent intelligence of the witness the bias or prejudice, if any, that a witness shows. Possible motives for falsifying testimony. And finally, all of the facts and circumstances during the trial which tend either to support or discredit the testimony. And I think through the years, lawyers have made a living out of attempting and sometimes on occasion successfully discrediting witnesses based on inconsistent statements. And again, there's nothing that precludes the defense from arguing vigorously that because Lieutenant Link said in an earlier proceeding this past summer that his recollection was that he arrived at the scene at six, six o'clock. And it turns out in reality, after checking all the pay logs and records and whatnot, he arrived on the scene somewhere around two o'clock. Defense is certainly free to argue with that inconsistency, whether under oath or not falls within one of those parameters that the jurors are instructed on. So I think for that reason, coupled with the fact that other authorities cited by the defense, 906.13, uh, 908.01, Vogel, Vogel versus State, uh, all they simply stand for is this proposition that the prior inconsistent statements are, or may be considered independent substantive evidence. Counsel says, well, we should at least let the jury in on that little lawyer secret. Well, the reality is there is no point to it because if there were not independent substantive evidence, 
then we would not be able to get up and argue in front of the jury the significance of those statements, and as such, the instruction is unnecessary. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Stry? I think I would be repeating myself. All right, well, we went over most everything this morning, but there's a reason why we have a formal instruction conference. As I listen to the parties, I am very uncomfortable with giving an independent instructions on this issue, because I think it draws undue attention to it. For example, I'm not sure that I... I don't think it's more important that some of the other bullets item listed in instruction 300, but I think it may be reasonable to add a bullet, another bullet to 300 that does not draw attention to it, but at least let the jurors know they can consider it. What I would suggest is another bullet in 300 that allows the jury to consider the consistency or inconsistency with the prior statements of the witnesses. If I look at the testimony of the witnesses who were questioned on inconsistent prior statements, and that's not limited to Mr. Link, as the parties indicate, there's others, and in many cases their testimony was consistent with what they said previously, in some cases, on some elements inconsistent. The comments in former instruction 320a suggest a separate instruction is not required because of the fact the jury is allowed to consider it, but I think it might be worthwhile clarifying to the jury the right or the fact that they can consider it, so that's my suggestion. And I said that I would accept the suggestion, and I do. I am indicating consistency as well as inconsistency. I accept the suggestion, and if the court adds the bullet point, I will consider number eight modified, and I will withdraw anything more from it. Mr. Fallon, any comment from the state? Uh, we need a minute, Judge. If you're going to do this, I think it has a direct bearing, and on perhaps one, uh, 180, and we want to talk about that amongst ourselves. What was the language that you were considering, Judge? Actually, I'm going to preface it with the following, so it will read as follows. The degree of consistency or inconsistency with any prior statements of the witness. If the court is contemplating that amendment to 300, then it seems to me, well, does that apply to what we have are inconsistent representations of statements made by the defendant, and does that then entitle the state to argue same? It seems to me... I realize he did not appear as a witness, but there are a couple of statements, where, and we're thinking primarily of the statement to Sergeant Colburn, and the, then a statement listed by the defense in the beginning of the trial to Mr. Is, is, it, is it Pierce? Beach. Mr. Beach, and there is an inconsistency there, so what? You have the better of me here. I don't have it in my head exactly what the statement you are talking about or what the content was. Extent of the contract contact between the, the defendant and Teresa Halbach. There's two different versions attributed to the defendant. Mr. Strang. I'm interested in hearing. I remember generally the testimony of the two men. Beach was the lat last witness on the first day of testimony, and of course, Colburn came later. But I'm interested in hearing more since I can't remember exactly what the inconsistency was. What's the state's recollection of what was said? Beach basically said that she, the statement of the defendant was that she was here, took a picture, left, went down the road, and turned left, or worse to that effect. And then I left out one, 147, or 447, right. right, which is now that we know what all the evidence is. That's an interesting rendition of the facts, but I will set aside that aside. Then you have Sergeant Colburn's visit, I believe. On the night of the 3rd? Yes, Thursday the 3rd, 7 or 7.30 in the evening, something like that. And his explanation is there's more contact other than she came, took a picture, and left. And then there's a brief discussion. She was paid. So does that very same proviso for the credibility, if you're going to, be, if you're going to put that bullet in for the general instructions, does it go in for the statements to the, of the defendant? Well, I mean, I've got to be, court's entitled to some intellectual honesty here. And the fact is that the answer is yes, in that, you know, if an out-of-court declarant statement is admitted under 908.05, it may be impeached or supported as if the person had testified. Now, with a the defendant, there's, a, of course, a constitutional overlay here because he wasn't a witness in the sense that the jury would understand that term at the trial. And... He has a right not to testify and his silence can't be considered against him. So the state would be well advised to be very, very careful about how it argues his earlier statements in part 
because as I understand, the state has agreed not to refer an argument to a statement to which Detective Remaker testified and another alleged statement to which Bobby Dassey testified. But here are the statements to Mr. Colburn, alleged statements to Mr. Colburn, the alleged statements to Mr. Beach are statements that were disclosed and that the state properly can argue if the state has not agreed not to argue those two statements. There's no reason the state would have, an, have to agree not to argue them. And if the state sees inconsistencies as a matter of intellectual honesty, it's entitled to draw the jury's attention to those, even though the defendant is the alleged speaker. But the state also has to be very careful not to run afoul of Doyle or Griffin or commenting on a defendant's silence and decision not to testify at trial. So there's room for an art for the argument 908.05 would suggest that to the extent Mr. Avery is in an out of court declarant whose statements are admitted for purposes of credibility and at least in some ways treated like other witnesses. There's room the instruction would apply and it's just treacherous territory and that's that's all I'm saying. And I will add on this the less that lest anyone think I have completely taken leave of my senses, the reason I so readily agreed to adding the term consistency as the court proposed is that there is an evidentiary base, basis for that. Prior consistent statements are treated different, differently under the rules of evidence than prior inconsistent statements. But at least one witness, Lisa Buckner, and her, had her credibility bolstered again by the in, introduction of prior consistent statements through Detective Weger, uh, Investigator Weger. So there's an evidentiary basis for adding the term consistency, and that's why I agree to it, and I continue to agree to it. I mean, I hope that helps. Let me let me suggest this. First of all, I'm going to take the words the degree of out there. I didn't assert them the first time, and as I was thinking about it, I'm not comfortable with those. That's fine. What if, so 300, I add the bullet for consistency or inconsistency with any prior statements of the witness. And in 180, I add a bullet that says consistency or inconsistency with any other statements of the defendant. That's fine. Does that do the job for both parties? Sure. I think that's, again, I will stand on what I just said about what the perils are for the state in making the argument, and there would be perils for us in making the argument too, in opening the door on comment about Mr. Avery's statements or a lack of statements. But with those qualifications, that's acceptable. And obviously, their statements of the defendant refers to the statements of a defendant that were admitted into evidence at this trial. With the understanding, there will be no comment on the fact the defendant did give other statements at the trial. I'm sure all of you are aware of that. Alright, Mr. Strang, does that address then, I think the number 9 was the theory of the defence instruction, which I believe has been addressed. Does that... I have already addressed it and only one remains, which I didn't submit in writing. It was an issue I raised briefly in chambers this morning concerns the state's cross-examination of Dr. Fairgrave. And the background is this, the state was pursuing what I thought was a perfectly appropriate line of cross-examination of Dr. Fairgrave on the fact that he did not prepare a report. In the main, Mr. Fallon's questions were unobjectionable and they were good cross-examination. One question, and it was the last question that he asked in this area before moving on, but one of the questions I thought crossed the line. And I had the court reporter prepare just a very brief excerpt of that question and the answer only, which I will read. The question was, question, and that's so when the gentleman who happens to be on the other side of the prosecution by the Crown, so that they would have fair notice of exactly what opinions you were going to express so they would know what they were. Answer, yes. I did not object, object at the time. I decided at the time, first of all, I was slow on the uptake. It seemed like, a cross, like it crossed a line to me. I wasn't as quick as I should have been in articulating to, to myself the reason that it crossed the line. It, I did not object at the time. Rather, at the next break, I raised the issue informally with Mr. Fallon. 
I think I probably even told him I was going to ask the court reporter to read back that testimony to me or prepare a short excerpt because I couldn't remember exactly what Mr. Fallon had said that rubbed me, had rubbed me wrong. The court reporter did prepare the short excerpt I just read a little later. I raised this informally in chambers and I don't even remember when, but it was well after Dr. Fairgray was off the stand by that time. And the problem is the suggestion that we did not give the state fair notice of Dr. Fairgrade's opinion. We did. We complied with section 971.223, well, whatever the provision is that requires the defense to give notice of expert opinions. It's true that we didn't give a report to the state from Dr. Fairgrade, but we're not required to do that under the discovery statute. That's one of two options. We chose the second option, which was to provide a summary of it, his expert opinion and its basis. We also provided his curriculum vitae. The state objected to the adequacy of our notice. The court directed us to provide some further, more specific notice of Dr. Fairgrave's opinion, and we did that. Once we amended our notice of his opinion, there was no further complaint from the state. And I think our discovery obligation was met and therefore, as a matter of law, there was fair notice of his opinion. Now, again, the fact, the mere fact that it, he didn't prepare a report is a fair subject for cross-examination. And the questions immediately preceded the question I quoted today were objectionable in my view, but I had no strategic reason for not objecting. Indeed, I knew at the time it was it was a problem. If my if my manner of handling it was a waiver, then it was a waiver without a reason, without a strategic choice or a uh, or or a good a good reason on which I could defend my waiver. And the intention, as I told folks off the record, which doesn't count, I understand, was to seek a brief curative instruction, not make a terribly big deal out of it but I thought it was worth curative instruction. I still do. At this point, I think the curative instruction should not refer to or need not refer to Dr. Fairgrave or even to the state. There's no need to scold at this point. A curative instruction could be that, you know, something to the effect that both parties provided adequate notice as required by law or fair notice as required by Wisconsin law. The opinions of their experts wouldn't have to be anything fancier than that. And I asked the court to give somewhere in the final instructions, a curative instruction along those lines. I also asked the court forbid a state argument that it was not given fair notice of Dr. Fairgrade's opinions. I think it was. I think we complied with the discovery statute in that respect. Mr. Fallon. Thank you. Much ado about, about little. As counsel acknowledges, the questioning and cross-examination was clearly appropriate. And the point simply being that Dr. Fairgrave, uh, who at every point in the past of his career had issued a report, did you issue a report in this case? And that's a fair cross-examination, nothing to apologize, nothing to apologize for. This, every now and again, as a prosecutor, we're entitled to throw a net or a lifeline to counsel. I don't see his need to fall on the sword here or accept some kind of reprimand from who may review this case in the future. It's entirely unnecessary. Again, the sole point is that he always writes a report, but he didn't write, write a report in this case, fair cross-examination. The other way of looking at this, because that's all that was intended by the question, by the way, and the way of looking at this is, as counsel has aptly noted, they have two ways of complying with the provisions. One was to write a report. One was to give a summary. They chose a summary. Don't beat yourself up now or second guess your selection, your choice. They chose a summary, not a report. Doesn't mean I can't ask the question that you always wrote a report every other time in the past, but you didn't write one here. So again, he's saying a waiver without knowledge, a waiver without strategic reason. That's not true. It had already occurred. It occurred back in January when the original report was submitted. So for that context, the state does not intend to argue that we didn't have notice. Although I would note inferentially, and I still do, that the amended disclosure contained an opinion which was different 
than the opinion rendered on the stand regarding the possibility of the burn barrel being the primary burn location. So for what it's worth, so for what that's worth, they were different. But the, but the intent of the argument that the state will make is simply that he always writes a report and he didn't write a report this time. That's the point of the question. And they had the opportunity to choose, as I said, a summary or a report. They chose a summary, but that's their right. So I don't think there's much to do about nothing. Well, I do need to be heard in reply because as I conceded, the general line of questioning cross-examination was appropriate. And if the questioning had stopped where Mr. Fallon says he meant to stop or with the point he says he meant to make, it would have been appropriate. If this had stopped with, so you always write a report, this is the first time in your career you haven't written a report, fine, unobjectionable. This question went the next step. It went further. It was, you know, by not writing a report then, in essence, there was not a fair notice of exactly what opinions you were going to express to the council for the other side so that they would know what they were. And I won't reread this. I'm paraphrasing it, but I read verbatim the final question and that the implication that there was... Read it verbatim again. Sure. Question. And here, now I wish I had gotten the preceding question, but it was, I think the preceding question probably was that Mr. Fallon said, which is, this is the first time you have not written a report, something like that. So the question is in issue begins. Question, and that's so when the gentleman who happens to be on the other side of the prosecution by the Crown, so that they would have fair notice of exactly what opinions you were going to express, so they would know what they were. Answer, yes. I will give it to the court now. Did Mr. Fallon mean to do anything wrong? No, he was pursuing a fair line of questioning. He went one question too far, in my view. It's a slip of the tongue. It happens in the heat of battle. Lord knows in cross-examination, I have asked one question too many at various points. But this was objectionable, and I missed it. I didn't make a timely objection. All right, here's what I'm going to do. If I understand it, Mr. Fallon, your point was not that you didn't get some discovery in this case that you were supposed to get, but rather he always prepares a report in all other cases, but he didn't in this one. That was the intent and the focus of the question. And it wasn't until afterwards that I gave some thought about the fact that he amended disclosure had one opinion that was different. But like I said, you already rule on that matter, so... Let me ask this. Do you intend to make a reference in your closing to the fact that, not that you didn't get a report that you should have gotten, but to the fact that it's significant he did not prepare a report in this case? Here's the, I'm not precluding you from doing that. All I'm saying, let me get to the point. If you say something like that in your closing, you'll have to add and let the jury know Something to the effect, I'm not saying we didn't get a report that we should have gotten, but it's significant he didn't prepare a report. Do you understand? Right. Maybe we're just coming at it from different angles. Our argument is not that we didn't have notice. The argument we want to make. The argument is he didn't write a report. Okay, I'm only saying that. If you choose to point that out to the jury. We have an obligation. I'll see what you're saying. And I think that addresses Mr. Strang your concern because you have acknowledged that he was entitled to show the jury that the witness usually prepared the report but did not hear. Yes. As long as there's not an implication that somehow the state didn't get something to which it should have been entitled. As long as there's no implication that the state did not get fair notice, which is what the question implied. And I would like that cured. And it can be cured in a general way. I'm not. I don't view it as a significant part of you know the many weeks and exhibits worth of evidence that came in in this trial. I don't think it wants its own instruction. But I will caution the state that if it raises that issue in any fashion in closing, that, that it reference the fact that the state is not claiming that it didn't get some notice it should have gotten. Before we leave jury instructions, I don't recall if I've asked the parties on the record if the verdict forms are acceptable. They are to the state. Yes. All right. I will make the modifications in 30180 that were placed on the record, otherwise I will leave the jury instructions as they were submitted to you today. 
with the exception of removing the red lining. Other than the defence requested instructions that the court has already been denied, does that resolve the issues on instructions? Yes. Yes. Before we break, Mr Strang, I understand you wish to ask the court to reconsider a previous motion made by the defence concerning the request to excuse a juror. I do. I will not name the juror, but this is the juror we have discussed before who previously served on a civil jury in a lawsuit brought by a witness here. And I think I can name the witness without disclosing too much. The witness was Lieutenant, I'm sorry, L Detective Dave Remaker of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, Sheriff's Office. As I understand, some years ago, it's a 1999 civil suit, Detective Remaker sought some compensation for injuries he alleged in a connection with an automobile accident. And our juror sat as a juror at that trial of the civil action. She was among those who voted for the jury verdict in that case. And I don't, I didn't look here to see whether that was a unanimous civil verdict or a 5-6 civil verdict. But my recollection is when that when she was questioned about it, she acknowledged that she voted either with all of the other jurors or with the majority that determined the verdict in the case. We went back to not, not, I shouldn't say we, that's a royal we, Mr. Beauty and I, our defense investigator, who is not a lawyer, to go look at the file in the earlier civil case, and he did that. Copied the summons and complaint, gave us copies of the minutes from, that, from at least some of the days of the trial and the special verdict form, and then also copied an excerpt of the testimony from one witness. I think she... Uh, a medical doctor who testified for the plaintiff, Detective Remaker. And that's why I asked the court yesterday to obtain the entire file in Mr. Remaker's case and bring it here so the parties could look at it. The court did that, and the box is in chambers. It's about the size of a box of 10 Girl Scout cookie boxes that I got recently in the mail. And I flipped through it. I don't know whether counsel for the state have availed themselves of that opportunity, but the court was kind enough to obtain the file and it's in chambers. Here's what appears at my glance though. The defense that the insurance company or the other, the driver who apparently caused the accident in that case presented to the jury was that Detective Remaker was malingering and ought not be compensated or ought not at least obtain the full compensation that he sought. And it looks to me, again, at a cursory glance, like much of the trial was fought over whether Detective Remiger, Remiger was malingering or not about the lower back injury that he described. In that sense, his credibility was critically at issue. And this is, this is just a real nice, tight example of that. And I'm reading from pages 11 and 12 of the testimony of the a uh, plaintiff's expert, Dr. Diana Lampsa, L-A-M-P-S-A. This is a par partial transcript of the proceedings in the civil case. Beginning at line 10 on page 11 of the partial transcript. Question, do you understand that Dr. Dahl, D-A-H-L, at one point in his statement of opinions, used the term malingerer to refer to Mr. Remaker? Answer, yes. Question, would you describe or define for the jury what's meant by that term? Answer, well, malingering is basically lying. Malingering is basically lying for specific result, like a person might malinger if they're lying to get out of work or if they're lying to get money in a court settlement, you know, making up symptoms or exaggerating physical symptoms for a specific gain. It's a specific kind of lying. Question. Can everyone hear Dr. Lamsa? I think everyone is comfortable with your voice level there. Answer, okay. Question, do you believe that Mr. Remaker is a malingerer? Answer, no, the kinds of comments I just made a couple of minutes ago, I described somebody who is absolutely opposite of a malingerer. He's, you know, very straightforward, straight shooter, just an honest kind of job, kind of guy, my impression, likes sports, likes, you know, to me, the profile, I can't remember if he was a Boy Scout or not, but the kind of guy who's in the Boy Scouts and mom and apple pies, totally a straight character, so nothing like that. And evidently, Dr. Dahl was the defense medical expert in that case, and that's what I get from the context. So that, it looks to me, is like 
like a large part of the trial issue was Detective Remaker's credibility. Clearly, when the jury returned a verdict of over $170,000, that credibility determin de determination was resolved in Detective Remaker's favor. And this juror was part of that credibility determination. So the argument, again, is that because of the ritual way in which we instruct jurors to decide the credibility of a witness here, and we have argued this afternoon at some length over pattern instruction 300 in criminal cases. And what, what should be added and what should be considered and what's fair game in determining credibility. Because of that, the, that ritual way in which we instruct jurors as judges of fact of the, of the facts to determine credibility, I think this juror now is objectively biased. She's gone through that ritual, that process as a judge of the facts once within the last seven years as to Detective Remaker. His credibility matters here too and ought to be considered on the trial record here, just like every other fact ought to be determined of the on the trial of record, on the trial record here, supplemented only by a juror's common sense and experience. Her experience proves this special role that we occasionally ask people to fill as a judge, as a judge of the facts in a lawsuit. And the determination of Detective Remaker's credibility on a whole different set of facts was not apparently an incidental issue in the prior case. It's not incidental here either. He's, he's a fairly important witness. I played a clip of him in the opening statement, my opening statement, a clip of a dispatch discussion that went right to our theory of investigational bias and tunnel vision. He testified here. He offered a statement of the defendant of which neither the state nor the defense had prior notice. He is one of the people who met with Mr. Avery on November 4. He's with the Sheriff's Department that we accused as being the source of the original source of the bias against Mr. Avery. He was involved actively in the identification and collection of evidence, not just for a week in November 2005, but again on March 1 and March 2 of 2006. In fact, I think on this record, he's the only Manitowoc County Sheriff's employee who was actively involved in collecting or identifying evidence in March of 2006, the search of Mr. Avery's garage. I don't think he was involved at all in the search on the same days in March 2006 in Mr. Avery's home. That's my recollection of the testimony. But I think he did play a role in the garage may have been the only Manitowoc officer inside the evidence tape, so to speak, in March 2006. So the juror did the right thing by bringing the issue to the court's attention. I will accept, because it's for the court to decide, from her demeanor and her answers, whether she's subjectively biased and the basis of her prior role with Detective Remaker and knowledge of him. But I think there is objective bias here. This isn't like a casual acquaintance. It, is, it isn't like somebody we might size up because we run into them at the grocery store. This is a judgment the juror once has made and I think unlikely to reconsider. As I noted by a loose analogy the first time I argued this, even with professional judges, judges of the law, when they are wrong in their judgment and a higher court reverses them in this state and sends them the case back down, there's enough of a presumption that the judge will be reluctant to reconsider his or her earlier judgments in the role of judge of the law, that the parties are entitled to a sub substitution without a showing of prejudice again on remand under Wisconsin law. There are in, again, a loosely analogous context, there are Un United States Supreme Court decisions that consider the question, for example, of vindictive re resentencing after a reversal on appeal and a remand of, and the defendant gets a higher sentence. There's constitutional law on that because the Supreme Court recognizes the institutional bias that all of us acquire in favor of our earlier judgments once they once they're thoughtfully rendered.
And it's asking a lot to expect a lay person in, in the special role of judge of the facts to decide credibility at this time without considering the judgment she made about credibility the last time she was a juror in a case involving Detective Remaker. So I think that's asking too much. It's not responsible to expect her to be able to do that. I think she's objectively biased here without casting aspirations on her character. I don't. To the contrary, she was right to raise the issue. She was conscientious to raise the issue. But now that's out. And now that we, but now that that's out, and now that we know something more about the 1999 civil case involving Detective Remaker, I think she should be relieved of further duties on the grounds of objective bias. Does the state wish to be heard? Yes, thank you. We would oppose the excuse striking for cause or the excuse of this juror. We're going to begin with our presentation with law, with the law. A, pers a prospective juror is objectively biased if a reasonable person in the prospective juror's position objectively could not judge the case in a fair and impartial manner. That's a citation from State uh, v. Mendoza with citation to the State v. Erickson. In State v. Falsher, uh, the Supreme Court noted, quote, the circuit court is partially, particularly well positioned to make a determination of objective bias, and it has special competence in this area. It is intimately familiar with the Bodar proceeding, and it is and is best suited to reflect upon the prospective juror's subject, subjective state of mind, which is relevant, as well as to the determination of the objective bias. Finally, as a backdrop, we ask the court to once again consider State v. Kiernan, K-I-E-R-N-A-N. And that case was dealt with the concept of whether a veteran juror as it was known at the time, could set aside prior opinions or knowledge in Judge Kiernan's case, solely on the evidence presented at her trial. I think those are appropriate legal standards. The most recent case on objective bias is State v. Dale Smith, and that was, I believe, the case of the administrative employee of, a, of the district attorney's office out in juvenile court sitting as a juror in a felony case in downtown Milwaukee. Those are our legal standards upon which the court must make a determination of objective bias. Now let's look at the facts and apply them to the law here. First and foremost, the juror sent a note. The juror is the one who called this matter to the attention of the parties, having recognized Detective Remaker after seeing him testify and not beforehand. The court, at the request of the parties, conducted a voir dire of the, of the juror. The juror reported no recollection of that case whatsoever. Though when pressed, all the juror could recall is something about she left the left lumbar being the focal point of the trial. All that could be recalled was the nature of the injury. The juror could not recall whether Detective Remaker even testified, could not recall the amount of damages awarded to Detective Remaker, did recall that he did prevail and that he was rewarded some money and she thought perhaps was $100,000, but she could not recall any of the circumstances. She could not recall the length of the trial or, as I already said, the focus of the trial, a trial that occurred six to possibly seven years before this trial. I think it's apparent and a reason inference can be drawn that there have been no contact whatsoever between the juror and Detective Remaker in the intervening years. So applying those the standards then, oh, uh, there's one uh, other distinction. While we do not diminish the significance, as it were, of Detect Detective Remaker's role in this case, the case against Stephen Avery will clearly not rise or fall solely on the basis of the testimony offered by Detective Remaker. Whereas in contrast, if everything is as counsel represents, and I believe it to be the case, Detective Remaker's role in his own case was far greater far more significant than this case. And I'll say that because then we have to evaluate the fact that that's true. And the juror has no recollection of that. Then let's take the reasonable juror standard. A juror in this position, a juror who has no memory of those facts or circumstances and were somehow 
to conclude that she's objectively biased and as counsel would suggest in favor of Detective Rimmaker because in that case, 10 or perhaps 12 other jurors found his version of events credible and thus awarded his damages for the extent in which he was injured. I think not. There is no basis for that. Then, you couple that fact with the representation that the prospective juror made, as I recall, during the voir dire. The juror reported that no other juror was aware of the service previously performed. The court asked, in fact, I believe, instructed the juror not to devise any of the other jurors, in this case, of her previous experience with respect to Detective Rimmaker. All of that, coupled with the fact that this juror came forward on their own. I think that's clearly a reasonable inference that if a problem did develop, if circumstances did come to light, that somehow the great lot of memory was revealed to her, the juror would tell us. We have already had the assurance of this juror that that would not affect deliberations in this case. The assurance that uh, that it not that knowledge would not be imparted to any other juror. And this is the subjective component that counsel has alluded, counsel alluded to and is reflected in the case law. The court had the opportunity to assess the juror's credibility. And under all those circumstances, the court made a reasoned determination at the time, which we ask the court to sustain now, is that the juror is not objectively biased or subjectively biased. And we would ask the court to deny that request. Mr. Strang. In reply, let me... Let me try this. I wouldn't be offering analogies if I had something specifically on point, but I don't think either Mr. Fallon or, and I know I haven't found anything directly on point. This appears to be a pretty new issue, but let me try this. Let's suppose instead that this juror were a high school teacher or a college professor. And when Re Detective Remaker had walked in and testified, the juror had said, oh my gosh, I remember now six or seven years ago, he was in my class. He was a student of mine. I have forgotten the name, but I remember the face. He was a student of mine and, you know, now that I think about it, I think I wrote him a letter of recommendation. And the juror tells us that. And we explore and we find out that it was a glowing letter of recommendation. Now, I don't know that I believe this juror here on the issues that go to the subjective bias and what she does or doesn't remember, but the court gets to decide whether or not it believes the juror. And that's why primarily I'm relying on objective bias. But let's suppose the court was satisfied in my example of the teacher professor who writes the letter of recommendation for the student from six or seven years ago and now remembers. And the court is not to remember much more than I wrote him a letter of recommendation. Well, if we dug a little further into the file and we found that it, not only was it a glowing letter of recommendation or letter of recommendation, it was a glowing one. And if my, we dug further and found that there were people specifically asking the teacher for, or the professor not to write the letter of recommendation, urging upon the teacher the fact that she ought not write a letter of recommendation for this student. I can't imagine that the court wouldn't find objective bias and excuse the juror. Well, here, by the by way of analogy, a $170,000 verdict in the face of opposition by the defense in this case is a pretty glowing letter of recommendation and is a glowing letter of recommendation endorsed by this juror in spite of evidently, you know, witnesses and arguments from counsel that the letter of recommendation, so to speak, the verdict, ought not be delivered. Just, again, setting aside uh, the subjective bias, which the court can judge objectively, this doesn't look reasonable for the outside person to say, what you ruled for this guy once as a juror, and now you're here, supposed to be judging him again as a matter of his credibility, but on entirely different evidence and without considering your earlier judgment on his credibility. It doesn't feel reasonable, objective, objectively reasonable. It doesn't look objective, objectively reasonable, I suggest. And it's not so much that I'm worried that the state is depreciating Detective Remaker's role in the trial. It's really, I'm worried, if anything, the state is depreciating the role of the juror. It matters. 
What she did matters in the 1999 civil case. That was an important function. She filled it. She filled it on presumably the evidence she probably should consider there in deciding his credibility. I don't think we can ask her to set that judgment aside now and make the judgment anew on a different set of factors entirely. It's just not reasonable to expect that one would be able to do that. And that makes her objectively biased, if not more. All right, the starting point is to take a look at the standards that the court is to apply when a challenge is made by the jurors on the grounds of objective bias. And that is the challenge that the defense is making here this afternoon. The law on the subject was recently restated in the Smith case that the counsel for the state referred to its quote taken from Faulkner, Faulkner case and sets forth the test as follows. The focus of the inquiry into objective bias is not on the individual perspective juror's mind but rather upon whether a reason or, or a reasonable person in the individual perspective juror's position could be impartial. When assessing whether a juror is objectively biased a circuit court must consider the facts and circumstances surrounding the voir dire and the facts involved in the case. However, the emphasis and assessment remains on the reasonable person. In light of those facts and circumstances, when a prospective juror is challenged on voir dire because there was some evidence demonstrating that the prospective juror had, had formed an opinion or prior knowledge whether the juror should be removed for cause turns on whether a reasonable person in the prospective juror's position could set aside the opinion for prior knowledge. And although this is termed objective bias rather than subjective, there is something of a subjective component to it. The court also noted, and this I believe is in Fokker, the circuit court is particularly well positioned to make a determination of objective bias, and it has special competence in this area. It is immediately familiar with the voir dire proceedings, and it is best situated to reflect upon the prospective juror's subjective state of mind, which is relevant as well to the determination of objective bias. I think what the court is getting at there is the fact that the basis for objective bias is often statements made by the individual juror in question and the court has to make a determination as to the credibility of the juror in that circumstance. The court has already ruled that the juror in this case is not subjectively biased and I don't understand that to be challenged today, renewing the information that she provided when the court voyeured at her earlier in the trial. I will first note that this matter came to the court's attention at the instigation of the juror. That is, after she saw Mr Rimmaker testify, she connected his face with his name, recognised that she had sat on a jury in, in a civil case which she was a plaintiff approximately seven years ago. Didn't feel that it caused her to be biased in any way, but recognised it could be an issue for the court, and brought it to the court's attention. When I voir dired her, I asked if she remembered whether he testified in the case. That was one of the first questions that I asked, because it would be directly relevant on the issue of whether or not she was influenced as to his credibility, and she indicated that she did not remember if he testified as a witness in the case. She said that on more than one occasion when I was questioning her. She thought that the trial was approximately a week long. She remembered that it was a civil case and the defendant or the plaintiff was awarded some damages. She indicated, I believe, that she thought it was around $100,000. When I asked her an open-ended question about what she remembered about the case, she said, what I remember about it is a lot of discussion about the lower left lumbar of the back and that it involved an accident down on that eye system with a couple of other vehicles. That's about it. She didn't remember anything about the individual witnesses who testified in the trial. She indicated there was nothing about her experience as a juror in that case with a defect whatsoever in her service as a juror in this case. And since she didn't remember whether or not Mr Rimmaker testified, it wasn't worth asking a question about what effect what she thought of his credibility, or what effect it might have, because she didn't remember him even testifying in the case. The court, first of all, with respect to her credibility, finds her to be a very credible individual. It was her own forthrightness that led to the matter coming to the court's attention in the first place. She indicated she really doesn't remember much about the trial that took place seven years ago. Specifically, she doesn't remember not only anything about Mr Rimmaker's testimony, if he did testify, but not even whether he did testify. In light of the fact, I have trouble remembering all the testimony that took place in the early stages of this case. I certainly can't find that her, her statement to the court is unreasonable in any way. I suspect most people would probably be in about the position she was. There's no indication that she had any connection with Mr Rimmaker either before or after the case in which she sat as a juror. 
So the question then comes down to, is a person in this juror's position someone who could not reasonably be expected to be a fair and impartial in this case, even if the court finds that she's not subjectively biased? And the court concludes that I don't think it's a particularly close case. I don't think she's objectively biased at all. I took a look last evening at a number of objective bias cases. The closest one that I actually found, and the most analogous one of the facts, I thought was the Fokker case itself. In that sense, that it involved the opinion of a juror of the credibility of a witness who was expected to testify at the trial in that case. And during the course of the voir dire in that case, the issue came up before the trial started. It was rather obvious that the juror involved had strong opinions concerning Hayes' credibility, and Hayes was a witness. For example, the juror said that I believe she had been a neighbour of the witness for some time. Her parents were still neighbours of the witness. She indicated in voir dire, I know she's a person of integrity, and I know she wouldn't lie. She then agreed with the defence counsel restatement. I guess it was him, the juror in that case, that based upon his knowledge of Miss Hayes as a next door neighbour, he believed she would not lie about anything. There was a lengthy history between the juror and the witness that the juror was acquainted with in that case. And the court found, and I think rightfully so, that if you have got a juror who says, I know this person, I know them well, and I know they wouldn't lie, that's not particularly a close case. That's what objective bias is all about. Even though the jurors later stated that the juror could put that feeling aside and the appeals court actually upheld the trial court's determination that the juror was not subjectively biased. In this case, the court believes there are a number of contrasts between the facts of this case and that case. First of all, there was never any type of closer relationship between the juror and Mr. Rimmaker. It's not a case of an acquaintance at work or any situation where the juror would have had an extensive opportunity to form an opinion about the witness credibility. Even more significantly is the fact that the one contact took place nearly seven years ago. It's hard for the court to say that the juror objectively has an opinion of the witness credibility that she should not be expected to set aside when she doesn't recall if he even testified in the case. There's no, she doesn't appear to have an opinion as to the witness credibility that the court has to ask whether or not the juror could objectively set aside. Let's assume, if one assumes that she remembered Mr. Rimmaker or remembers him testifying, the argument would have to be that because this juror found Mr. Rimmaker credible in a civil trial that took place seven years ago that no person in this juror's position could objectively evaluate Mr. Rimmaker's testimony in this case. That is, I don't think, even if she did remember his testimony, unless there was some reason why she couldn't set aside an opinion that she was convinced he would never lie, that she would probably be objectively biased and be forced to leave the jury in this case. But we don't even get to that because I find her testimony to be very credible that she doesn't remember if he testified in that case. It's one thing to pull out a transcript today that's something that the witness said seven years ago at the trial that reflects on Mr. Rimmaker's testimony. But objectively, I think most people over seven years would not have a specific recollection of that. There may be some people who could, but the court finds that the juror is not one of those people. And even if there was some recollection, Finding that someone was credible on one occasion doesn't mean that you can never judge their credibility again. As Mr Strang was speaking, and last evening, as I was thinking about this, I was trying to come up with analogies myself. I recognise the fact that the court has, I see police officers testify on a regular basis, often at suppression hearings. If I make a determination on one hearing that they are credible, I'm not sure that disqualifies me for the rest of my judicial career from evaluating their credibility again at a later hearing. Granted, I'm not a juror, I'm a judge. But if the question is objective bias, and I, because I determined them to be credible one time, could never do it again, that would leave the judicial system in tough straits. You know, from my own experience, I have had officers testify in front of me. Sometimes I find their testimony credible, sometimes I don't. doesn't mean that I necessarily think they are lying or not. You can objectively evaluate credibility in those situations, I believe. And certainly the situation involved this year doesn't get close to that because she only had one contact with Mr. Rimmaker. It was nearly seven years ago and she doesn't appear to remember much about it. It's a very far cry from all the other cases in which objective bias has been found. I don't believe there is any evidence here to suggest this juror is objectively biased, and therefore the court is going to again find that she should not be removed from this jury 
and there is no basis to remove her on the grounds that either subjective or objective bias. Council, let's take a 15 minutes break and then please meet me in chambers.